today we've got an amazing soundtrack, a gem really for the Wonder Swan. This is Pixelated Audio, episode 59. Welcome to episode 59 of the bi-weekly video game music and retro gaming podcast, Pixelated Audio. Today we're going to be listening to a completely awesome little soundtrack from Bandai's handheld, The Wonder Swan. We're your hosts, I'm Brian, and this is James. How's it going? Yeah, we got a great soundtrack to spotlight today for you guys, and I was actually pretty happy you agreed to do a Wonder Swan episode. Well, I wasn't going to say no. <laughs> Um, no, the Wonder Swan though is kind of a hit or miss. Right. You know, there's a lot of really crappy music, but there's a few standout soundtracks that are incredible, much like this game, Buffer's Evolution. The track that brought us in was the title theme from the game, and what a great way to get started. Yeah, explosive. Oh, man, I, you guys are going to hear a lot of this really progressive, harmonizing uh, melody that's uh, really prevalent in the soundtrack, and mm -hmm. I think this is a great way to kind of get those veins, you know, pumping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a really aggressive sound. I love the, the really cool, like, drum beats with the, the great sustain notes over top, and I love how those drum hits get towards the loop. It just feels really energetic and, like, really kind of um, really fun to play. Yeah, and surprisingly, there's a lot of uh, really good bass, mm -hmm. I think, in, the, in the, the whole soundtrack, and this track is a good example of that just a, a lot of fun yeah no and i loved how all the notes were all over the place in like a really good way there was a lot of variety you know scales going up and down and kind of hopping around and it just was really fun and, I, and to me when i first heard this soundtrack i hadn't played the game yet and i was just like oh man i'm really excited to play this game yeah no i was in the same boat in fact why did we pick this game i think we were just uh we decided we want to do a wonder swan episode and then we we're just looking through some different games and yeah we kind of came across this one pretty early and it really stood out. Yeah, it just, you know, we, we were listening to, uh, like you said, a few different albums, uh, a few different soundtracks. And we put this on. And, you know, the first track, we we're like, okay, this is this is cool. And the second track, oh, man, this is this is awesome. Mm -hmm. Third track, wow, this is... And just, oh, like, after, you know, the course of 15, 20 tracks, like, oh, my God, we got we to gotta talk about this. Yeah. This, this is a really cool soundtrack. It's I think it's a, kind of a little gem, too. Yeah. No, and, it, and we played the game, and it was pretty fun. But, I mean, we always like to start a new system that we've never done before with a game that's that's kind of exciting. So, right. uh, I mean, there's definitely games for every system that the music's really good and the game's bad. But we kind of thought this was a little bit of both. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I'm really excited to get going. So let's talk about the, the Wonder Swan a little bit because I think some people aren't really familiar with the system. It never it never came out here. Yeah, so if you're not familiar with the system, the Wonder Swan is a handheld console by Bandai and was released in 1999 for Japan only. There were a total of three versions of the system, the Wonder Swan, which is in black and white, the Wonder Swan Color, and the Wonder Swan Crystal, but all three were actually discontinued in 2003. You know, it's it's really weird for me. I guess it kind of hits home a little bit because I got to Japan I, in 2001. Mm -hmm. And so right at kind of like the tail end, the, the Wonder Swan color had been out for a little while. And um, I picked up a Wonder Swan color. I was mm -hmm. really jazzed about it. I think it was like 20 bucks. It was, yeah. you know, not, not very expensive like Nissan. And um, I remember watching TV and seeing a commercial for the Wonder Swan crystal. Mm -hmm. It just makes me feel like, wow, like, 
this is now kind of retro game. I was there for the right. release of it. There, I think it was like a One Piece commercial because One Piece, you know, the, the anime was mm-hmm. like really, really hot. And so uh, it was, you know, kind of touting the the graphics and the color and the, and the gameplay and stuff. And uh, I remember the commercial pretty well because I was like, oh, my God, I got to get myself. I was already a retro gaming fan mm-hmm. kind of, you know, way back then, too. And so I was like, oh, man, this is another another handle. That, wow. This yeah. is going to be awesome. No, and the crystal was really beautiful looking, too. So you guys have to look up some some screenshots of these different games and the different systems. Yeah. But, I, you know, I remember when the color came out or not when the color came out, but when the crystal came out, I was thinking to myself, oh, maybe I should pick one up. I mm-hmm. just bought a color not too long before. I was I was kind of looking at a, a bunch of the the game shops like um, like uh, Super Potato and stuff mm-hmm. like that had you know the original black and white Wonder Swan kind of they had them in trove like these huge piles right and so you know they couldn't sell them enough at this point because everybody jumped over to the color right. the color version and then uh, when the crystal came out even the the Wonder Swan color had had dropped in price so I got mine used for like twenty bucks but mm-hmm. I think shortly after the crystal launched it was like ten bucks six bucks i mean yeah. it was it was really cheap and the color games and the black and white games the, the monochrome games were pennies yeah so i i picked up a few i didn't have a whole lot but uh and i definitely didn't have this game which i feel like i missed out because mm-hmm. it has an excellent soundtrack but it was something that i i remember very vividly and mm-hmm. a, a good uh, memory of being over there when i was younger All right, so before we go any further, let's talk about Bandai for a minute, since this is a new system on the show that we haven't covered yet other than expansion packs. Right. So Bandai started out in the 1950s as a toy manufacturer, basically Japan's version of Fisher-Price, doing like toy cars and models, things like that. Uh, Then they got into licensing anime characters, and in the 70s, they started making little LCD games based on those licenses. Right, like the little... um I guess almost kind of like a Game and Watch kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, I mean, we saw a whole bunch of different versions of that that weren't, you know, Nintendo Game and Watches that you know, like Konami was making them all over the place. So, right. And then they got their first taste of the game industry when they brought the Intellivision to Japan in 1982. Then they became one of the first third-party developers for the Famicom. But their biggest success was the Tamagotchi. Oh my God, the Tamagotchi. Yeah. I- I got to say, I'm a little bit embarrassed to say it, but I had one. Yeah, my sister had one, I- and I used to hide it from her Dude, all the time well, so that it would on, die. <laughs> Come on, man. Yeah. I had one. Oh, my sister had one. Yeah. <laughs> no, but um, no, I, everybody, everyone had one. Oh, yeah. I was in junior high, I think. And it was just, it was extremely popular. And like we attached them with a little keychain to our backpacks. And we basically just kind of, you know, fart around on those during during yeah. class. It was a great time waster. Like, I yeah, mean, they, they were dumb. But. Yeah. I mean, they were the equivalent to some, you know, 99 cent app on a phone now, but I really actually kind of want one. I remember when you went to Japan last, I had messaged you and says, hey, why don't you pick up some Tamagotchis? And you're like, oh, I didn't know you wanted any. Yeah. I just saw like a whole bin of them the other day. <laughs> just walked right past. Yeah. Them. Yeah. So um, Bandai had decided at this point that basically video games were the money maker. Right. Like this is. This is the next big thing. Oh, yeah. They were exploding back then. Yeah. So the president of Bandai thought merging with Sega was going to be their way to capitalize on that. And so Sega, he had been talking to Sega kind of on his own, Mm -hmm. had been talking to Sega. And uh, Sega was all in. They're like, yeah, this let's do this merger. But Bandai's board of directors ended up calling the whole thing off. And this basically left Bandai to kind of go out on their own into the market they mm-hmm. they had no other support this is their first kind of attempt in but they wanted to pursue the the video game industry so man can you imagine what would happen if if bandai and sega had had actually merged back then that would have been could have been pretty cool uh, maybe we would see more hardware i don't know yeah. you know so uh, anyways let's talk about gunpei yokoi for a second because he was known for creating the game boy uh the nintendo game and watch and after the failure of the virtual boy in 1996 he left nintendo to create his own engineering and development company called koto laboratory the game boy was still hot at this time oh of course yeah so band i thought hmm maybe we should talk to this guy and see what's up oh yeah i mean the game boy was huge so you couldn't really get much bigger than the game boy yeah so it was kind of i guess talking to him was kind of like they're like okay Hey, this guy, he he knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Maybe he can help us out here. And that's basically how the Wonder Swan came to be. Yeah, I mean, it's funny that that he created the Game Boy and then they went and talked to him to create the Wonder Spawn, but the Wonder Swan was designed to compete directly against the Game Boy. That's pretty pretty funny. I mean, it's like if we started our own 
other VGM podcast. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so Kotal Laboratory, though, they're, they're still around. Yeah, so their website is still up, and it lists a bunch of the games they've worked on, including both Gunpei and Buffer's Evolution. Uh, they're still doing games today, but unfortunately, it seems like they're mostly being contracted to do you know subpar mobile games. But Ugh. I'm sure a bunch of the original staff has left by now, so it's a bunch of new guys that are just kind of you know trying to keep the lights on, I guess. We've seen a lot of these old right. developers go out of business by this point, so... They must be doing something right to, well, you know, to still they, be around. They might be really good engineers, and they might have really good ideas, but they're just getting really crappy contracted mm-hmm. work. So Yeah, and when you have someone that's contracting you, it's not really your project anymore. They kind of say, you may give them something beautiful and amazing, and they say, eh, let's do this and this, or costs and uh, stuff like that. Yeah. So you end up with this subpar product that may not be their fault at all. All right. Yeah, so let's, let's go back into Buffer's evolution. Let's mm-hmm. talk about the game for a little bit. So... Buffer's Evolution came out uh, right at the tail end of 1999 on December 9th. It was created by the company that knew the hardware better than anyone else, Mm -hmm. Coda Laboratory, which we just talked about. And then it was published by Bandai. Yeah, and it kind of fits into this weird genre. It's a 2D side-scrolling platformer, but it has these maze racing-like elements mixed into it. It's very odd. (laughs) Yeah, but it's pretty fun. Yeah. But we'll get into that in a minute, though. So let's actually get into some more music. Yeah, so we're going to play the character select or the stage select music, and we'll be right back. You just heard the character select or the stage select screen composed by Sasaki Junana, Hira, and Neon for Buffer's Evolution on the Wonder Swan. What an interesting little track. It, it has like this kind of jazzy, laid back saxophone. Kind of bluesy. Yeah, and it, but it has like this jam session feel to it because it, there's notes all over the place and it feels like somebody's kind of like showing off what they're, what they're able to do. And that's actually a pretty fun little track. Yeah, I, I liked it a lot. I mm-hmm. thought it was, uh, it's it's weird. It's kind of got that kind of dancey, bluesy, mm-hmm. jazzy kind of feel to it. And then um, you get these weird stops, like, mm-hmm. you know, and I like that. It's almost it's almost big band in a sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It kind of has like that stop and take a new direction feel to it. And yeah. for such a little thing, it really has a lot of notes crammed into it. Yeah, there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of a... Uh, thought i think put in this mm-hmm. simple little track you're on, you're only going to be on the stage select screen for you know a few seconds mm-hmm. so it's you know it's pretty cool it's pretty uh ambitious to have a, a one minute track for such a a short interval of of time that you're right on the screen so uh let's talk about the composers a little bit because mm-hmm. we don't have a whole lot to say on them um sasaki junana hira and neon these are all pseudonyms mm-hmm. and uh the only way so we were looking. Like, we couldn't find any composers on this. Right. It's, I mean, there's really not a lot of information about this game in general. So yeah. composers, we find, end up having the least amount of information for the most part. Yeah. So we were asking around some Japanese forums, uh, mm-hmm. some old school BBSs and stuff like that. And uh, I was I was curious. I was like, hey, does, does anybody know who composed this? Mm-hmm. Like at all? I, I you know. I don't think I'm going to make it through the whole game to see the credits right. you know, by the time we record. So it's just like, hey, let's see if we can find something. Well, and we even saw some speed runs that didn't have the credits in it. So yeah, we were like, kind of like, Ugh. Ugh. yeah. Yeah. So um, so I asked. I said, hey, does anybody know these names? There's Sasaki Junana, clearly a pseudonym. Mm-hmm. And then Hira, which is, yeah, that's, again. That's definitely not a real and name. And then Neon. And so it, I was like, okay, none of these names sound familiar to me. Let me, let me ask. Let me see if anybody... You know, it just kind of puts this kind of tick in your ear, like, oh man, maybe I know them from this company. Nobody, yeah. nobody seems to know. But the sound of the 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 whole soundtrack, I guess, has a very almost Konami feel to it. Maybe mm-hmm. like some Taito or or something like that. But um, it doesn't 
it's it's hard. We don't we don't know who actually composed mm-hmm. this. This is going to be one of those other uh, those other games that drives us nuts for yeah. the next year. No, I mean we talked about that. Koto Laboratory was the one that developed the game, mm-hmm. but we've seen in the past that the people that developed the game don't always do all the sound. Right. So this could have been pushed out to some other companies, yeah. and we know that you know Taito and and other companies did work on the Wonder Swans. Yeah. So it could have been I mean anyone, and we've seen that. You know, sometimes these pen names do get really famous, even though it's a pen name, but we weren't able to really link it to anything else. Yeah, And there were some people that replied and were like, hey, you know, I'm pretty sure this is a contractor. Yeah. You know, like if if it's a one time, a one shot deal, I mean, they're very talented. They Mm -hmm. know how to use the hardware. So maybe it's another composer that's doing stuff else elsewhere Mm -hmm. that used this pseudonym just because they were doing contract work for right. for Bandai. Well, and we've also seen composers that use a pen name and then never want to be associated with the game for whatever reason and move on and don't really do any more game music. So Yeah, one one name comes to mind with that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Two episodes back. Go check it out. Yeah. Um yeah, so so let's get back into the game for a second. Yeah, so back to the game. This game has a pretty odd little story. Yeah, <laughs> it's very odd. Are yeah. you kidding me? Yeah, so it's set in a post-apocalyptic future where a gambling crime syndicate comes up with an idea to make some money by using the scraps found on Earth. They take three animals and fuse them with the spare machine parts to create these beast robot hybrids. <laughs> 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 they use a bird. What? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's pretty interesting. Um, they, <laughs> it's, interesting is a really soft word. Well, it's very different. I mean, I can't really think of anything else that that you know, like a crime syndicate gambling ring. You know, that, that creates this idea that ends up being the whole idea for the game. I just want to know what the the developers were thinking when they were like kind of storyboarding this. They're like, hey, yeah, let's get these three ro- these three animals, fuse them with all this this crap found on Earth. Well. Fusing robots and animals together was pretty popular back then. I think okay. the gambling crime syndicate is the more interesting part of the whole <laughs> thing. But they end up using a bird, a lion, and a rhino, and then they set them loose in these dangerous maze-like levels and take bets on the outcome. <laughs> it sounds like abuse to me. Yeah. It, oh, it definitely does. <laughs> it's definitely people that are bored and aggressive. I mean, they're a crime syndicate, so yeah. uh, and they just want to see what ends up it's happening. Like very, very illegal. Buffer's Evolution is a genre of its own. Yeah. It's it's really its own kind of thing. Uh, the goal of the game is to complete these really long levels as fast as possible while still collecting 10 mechanical parts. It reminds me of Uniracers. Do you ever play that mm-hmm. on the Super NES? Yeah, it's Uniracers without the Uniracer. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not not sure if that makes sense. Yeah. But uh, there is a, there is a an item that's kind of like a unicycle. Yeah. And yeah. that was the first. I, I actually ended up getting that item. And it was pretty fun. It made you move a lot faster. But yeah. you actually don't need to collect all 10 parts. But by collecting them, you can get special items as well as health. And to me, the game is slightly reminiscent of something like Sonic, where you're moving really fast, get to the end of the level. But this has a little bit more emphasis on your finish time. Right. Because right when you finish it, it presents that time. It's like, mm-hmm. hey, this took you five minutes minutes or whatever and it logs that into your your records right yeah it's yeah. like an old game that was designed for speed running e- exactly <laughs> pretty cool um it's so each character has a buffer that they can do which is the ability to turn into a metallic object to kill enemies and this can actually help you get to higher areas because once you hit an enemy with this buffer you can bounce off in a different direction yeah the controls are pretty simple i mean it's just the directional d-pad mm-hmm. you know you're running around and then you have jump and then the buffer button yeah i guess where you kind of transform into this it's almost like a double-ended scissor kind yeah. of thing it's very very odd i don't yeah, know why they're kind of weird i don't know why they went with that but uh yeah you turn into this this kind of um buffer i guess mm-hmm. and you can land on enemies and it kind of bounces you up mm-hmm. and it's almost kind of pinball like yeah i was watching a speed run and, and and really like if you learn to like utilize it and time it out it can be really really beneficial oh, yeah. so uh yeah it's it's a really it's a really interesting game but it's actually really really cool yeah well and you use that buffer button to actually change into your specials too so at the right, beginning right, of the level right. you can if you have other items that you can equip like that unicycle feature uh, you can equip it and then you hit your buffer button to say hit an enemy and then once he comes back from the buffer he'll equip the unicycle and take off so it's kind of neat that they use that one button to cycle through we right. didn't get a chance to play with having two items equipped because you can actually equip two of them but 
we assume that you just cycle through them with the buffer button. Yeah, another kind of interesting um, thing about the the controls is that when you jump, it's a basic jump, but mm-hmm. in order to kind of do a slide, you have to perform the jump ahead of time and then hit down. Right. So you can slide through these really narrow kind of passageways and stuff like that. And if you time it out right, you can really... Uh, it's it's really has that speed run mentality mm-hmm. because you know you time it up the the right frames and you can slide through small passages and 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 keep going it's it's kind of cool yeah the level design is actually really really interesting and that slide feature is very useful if you can pull it off but like you said it's it's a little bit difficult it's a little odd a little to sketchy. hit like the jump and then down at the same time to make him slide so you end right. up getting stuck in an area and wasting some time. Anyways, let's get into some more music. What do you say? Yeah, no, I'm really excited for the next track. Yeah, so this is from the first stage in the game. It's A1, but it also plays during D1. So let's check that out and we'll be right back. You just heard stage A1 slash D1, composed by Sasaki, Junana, Hira, and Niyan for Buffer's Evolution on the Wonder Swan. This is a pretty pretty sweet little track. Yeah, right? I really like this track, actually. Yeah. I liked the kind of swelling harmonies. Mm-hmm. I thought, uh, you know, about those harmonies, what, what makes them really cool is that they kind of have these sweeps into mm-hmm. it. So it's like, what? And then it goes right into like the harmony, and it makes it really... Almost reminiscent of Neo Geo Pocket Color, mm-hmm. uh, Sonic, and stuff like that. Yeah. It has a lot of that um, kind of sound to me. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely could see that. I thought it was a very heroic track, really exciting for the first level. And it made, gave me this feeling that if I were able to complete the game, that maybe I could set these animals free. And, <laughs> you know, like they would survive. Like, you know, like we mentioned before, it kind of feels cruel. What they've been, what they've done, right, these right, animals, right. But, uh, it's like a rat maze. Yeah, yeah, and you know, like, so I thought, oh man, this is very kind of uplifting. Like, yeah, like I'm ready to go. I can do this. The, the levels are really fun. The music is really great. I played, a, I played this first level probably like 10, 15 times, and I never got tired of the track, and it just loops the whole time you're doing yeah. it. So it's really, cool. it's really fun track. I liked it a lot. Yeah, let's get into our next track. This is actually uh, BGM Seven, which plays during stage C one. Thank you. 
You just heard BGM7 or Stage C1, composed by Sasaki Junana, Hira, and Neon for Buffer's Evolution on the Wonder Swan. Man, I love this track. Yeah, it's it a really good so one. It's so cool. In fact, I heard this in the car and I was just like, oh my God, this is <laughs> awesome. Man, like the, the, the harmonies again are mm-hmm. incredible. And then the bass, it, it gets really kind of sporadic. It, the bass kind of goes uh, up into the kind of mid range. It mm-hmm. goes da 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 da, and then it drops back down. It's like do 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 do. Mm-hmm. I think that is just wow. Yeah, this is really cool. This track had a lot of really nice variety between that high range and the low range, and I loved how it stayed in the low range for quite a bit. Right in the very beginning, though, there's those like shaky, like ex- extended notes. Oh man, that like really gets me. I really like that yeah. a lot. Um, this so- was a very, very good track to mm-hmm. kind of showcase. I think this uh, this whole soundtrack. Yeah, it's to me it really this track especially makes it me really sad that we couldn't find much on these composers, composers to see yeah. like you know what are their backgrounds, where do they come from, what kind of music did they grow up on, or were influenced really heavily by, and we're also seeing that you know we're getting a few tracks into the episode and there's not a lot of variation, so we don't know if you know one person did one this track did. or if they worked as a collaboration. But or- it's it's very clear that these guys have chops. Mm-hmm. Like, oh yeah, they understand not only composition in general, but they understand how. The, the Wonder Swan hardware works, right. sound hardware, the uh, channel limitation. They understand all of these different components for video game music. We basically talk about all the time on this show. Right. So it, it's definitely somebody, I think, that is uh, maybe today more renowned. I mm-hmm. think that these aren't just like a, like a one-off. You right, know, it's not right. like they, they did this and they're out. I, I really think that if if we dig a little deeper, we, may be able, we might be able to find... Um, something. I mean, we've dug pretty deep at this point, but I think right. that maybe there's some some ends that we can kind of figure out. Well, I mean, it could be something as you know, it's as simple as they worked for another company, didn't want the, that company to know that they were working on this game for the you know the Wonder Swan, which you know pulled its weight in its time, but didn't you know see any any type of numbers near the Game Boy. But I mean, it's just it's really interesting to see, and also the fact that Koto Laboratory, who developed the system itself, was there to kind of you know, usher, the, yeah, 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 make sure that they did everything properly. That could have played a huge role in the fact that this music worked out so well with the limitations of the system. So we're talking about the system. Let's actually get in to some of the hardware of the Wonder Swan. We haven't really oh, talked yeah. about it much on the show because, like in the expansion packs, we keep it really brief, mm-hmm. uh, like about the the music or the uh, hardware specifically, or the the sound chip or wh- what have you. But uh, let's let's dive in a little bit more. All right, so again, 1999, Bandai released the Warner Swan, which housed a 16-bit CPU. Right. And what Bandai did that was really cool was they offered the system at a really low cost, which was about 4,800 yen or $50. And it was designed with a remarkably long playtime of about 40 hours for a single AA battery compared to the Game Boy and the Neo Geo Pocket Color, which takes two batteries. That's incredible. Yeah. Now, like, even for me, when I first got it, I'm like, this thing only requires one battery. Mm-hmm. And I don't even think I changed it for, like, a year. Yeah. No, that's, that's pretty pretty insane. 40 hours for a, a single battery is pretty nice. And what's really cool about the Wonder Swan is it can be played both horizontally and vertically. That's incredible yeah when i saw that i mean i don't have a wonder swan i never played a wonder swan other than through emulation well you've seen mine but yeah, yeah i've seen them I, I definitely know what they look like but i mean that really blew my mind because during this time period things like uh vertical arcade shooters were still very prevalent so i mean seeing things like that ported to this handheld would be really cool yeah and it had a really interesting game library too oh yeah yeah so not only did we see a diverse library from bandai but we saw companies like squaresoft namco and taito all making games for it yeah and a lot of these are very well known like final fantasy mm-hmm. 1 and 2 came out on the wonder swan color and they look incredible yeah they play really well well and namco and taito were also really big in the arcade market so i could exactly. see them being really drawn into a system that i mean i can't think of a vertically screened system <laughs> so, I mean, that's just really cool. Yeah. Now, this system didn't leave Japan, so it's really kind of hard to judge how popular Bandai would have been, but it did sell 3.5 million units just in Japan. There was a ton of these floating around. Yeah, and this was, to remind you guys, during the time of Game Boy's reign. Yeah, so, I, I mean, I remember seeing them on the train every mm-hmm. now and then. It wasn't as uh, prevalent as, you know, a Game Boy or, right. or Game, Boy, uh, Game Boy Advance, actually. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, because at this point, Game Boy Advance was out, Wonder Swan, Crystal yeah. was out, and I, I saw a lot more Game Boy Advances, but there was the occasional guy playing, mm-hmm. uh, you know, One Piece or playing some of these anime animated series or licensed yeah. games on the Wonder Swan. Well, with 1999, that was right on the cusp of the Game Boy Advance, and so by 2003, we could see that like they couldn't really hang with the Game Boy Advance, yeah. just in the popularity alone. Well, let's think of it like this. How does Wonder Swan and the Wonder Swan Color and Crystal compare to other handhelds on the market? Mm-hmm. The Wonder Swan was graphically superior to the Game Boy and the Neo Geo Pocket Color, even though it was monochrome. Mm-hmm. And games uh, at the time, even though it was monochrome, they were just really impressive because they had this really massive uh, high-res display to kind of work with right. so you get these different shades of gray but because of the higher resolution they just they look really really pretty and they look well defined mm-hmm. the problem is that with a 16-bit cpu it was only clocked at just over three megahertz which is actually slower than both the neo geo pocket color and and the Game Boy Color. And it's even clocked slower than the original Game Boy, which I think is about 4 megahertz, something like that. Which is kind of crappy because it came out a decade later. Yeah. No, and it, that's that could be a huge factor in how some of the games played and stuff like that. But I think the reason why they clocked it so slow was to make... Like to make that battery, that single, Mm -hmm. you know, double A battery just kind of extend forever. Right. And they succeeded with that. Right. And we saw that was a huge selling factor for the Wonder Swan. Right. Doubled that with the fact that it was horizontally and vertical, all that stuff, and very cheap. Yeah. Now, the color model is essentially the same CPU, but with more RAM. Right. And the crystal is mostly an upgrade to the TFT LCD display, which makes it look quite a bit better. Yeah. It does look a bit cleaner a little bit clearer Mm -hmm. Um, i never had a crystal i only saw like them demoed in shops and stuff like that but i think the color looks great on its own oh yeah i mean we were just saying before that it really it seems like the color might be the best way to to get this system if you had a chance i think so it's the best price point at least but really one of our biggest gripes was that the system didn't have a headphone jack you actually had to buy a small accessory to attach the expansion port much like the Game Boy Advance SP so you couldn't do like linked games oh, yeah. and listen through headphones at the same time drove me nuts i bought one and i yeah. was like okay i'm going to be playing this on the train awesome you know yeah. on my commute to work and lo and behold no headphone jack and i was like oh my god like i bought this for 20 bucks mm mm-hmm. mhm here I am having to spend like I think it was like Ju Hapyaku. It was basically like eighteen bucks, almost twenty bucks, yeah. to buy the adapter. And I was like, oh my god, I should have just bought a crystal or something. Like yeah, that. I mean, one playing on the train, other people aren't going to want to hear the games you're playing, all the beeping and all that, and the yeah. music and stuff. And two for. People well, like this us, is, that, this is Japan. Maybe they did want to hear it. Yeah. I don't know. But also for people like us, we want to hear the music and the sound effects in as clean as possible way. So that's really kind of, I mean, even for the Game Boy Advance SP, like I was so excited for it. But then I was like, oh man, I got to buy like this $10 <laughs> adapter to be able to play. And then I can't have like the headphones that have the automatic adjust on the, the straps. So. Right. On, on that note, let's talk about the audio side of the hardware since that's kind of the most relevant mm-hmm. info, I think, for this episode or for this show. In all honesty, I'm quite new to the audio hardware. I really kind of only knew the basics going in, but Mm -hmm. dove into it for this episode so I can kind of have something to talk about. But it's a really mysterious piece of hardware, I think. Yeah, I mean, the whole system actually is. Yeah. I mean, there's some documentation, but it's still missing bits and pieces here and there. Yeah, the basic breakdown is that the Wonder Swan, and this is for all models, the monochrome, the color, and the crystal, they can play back audio from four different channels that rely on the NEC V30MZ CPU. Yeah, each channel can produce sound from these short 4-bit samples with selectable frequency. Yeah, and I'm not quite sure where these samples are actually stored in memory, but um, like I said, it's a mystery. Yeah, and the volume of each audio channel is controlled by writing two 4-bit values, one for the left and one for the right output channels. So let's go ahead and fire up a track real quick. This mm-hmm. is We played this earlier. This is from A1, so let's listen to that. This is with the, all the channels on and everything. Now, let's go ahead and solo out channel one real quick. Okay. Just, just so you can hear it. Now, this channel doesn't have any special features, but it can do standard 4 bit sample playback. So, I mean, sounds yeah, cool, right? It's pretty standard. Channel two, however, let me flip that over, can be used to playback 
raw 8-bit PCM voice samples. And this seems to be used mostly for sound effects and buffers evolution, mm -hmm. but I'll show you what I mean in a second. Right now, we're just hearing, you know, standard kind of 4-bit sample playback. Right. Sounds the same channel 1. I mean, obviously different notes, but right. same kind of thing, right? Channel 3, however, is, is really cool. So let's listen to this real quick. Channel 3 has a sweep functionality with two different parameters that the uh, developers can set. So let's solo this out because you can hear the sweeps pretty well, I think, in this. Oh man, that, yeah, that's super cool to hear. That, that's awesome, right? Yeah, and then lastly is channel 4, and this can play the same 4-bit samples as channel 1 and the other channels, mm -hmm. but it can also be put into noise mode for the percussion. So it's like kind of that white noise, right? Mm -hmm. That super random white noise. Yeah, so your standard fare kind of mm -hmm. Yeah. The system only has a tiny mono speaker, but with the headphone accessory that we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. you can get this very clean stereo sound at 22 kilohertz. And it just it just sounds really, really clean. You guys are listening to it, I think, at its its best. You right. listen to it in stereo sound, right? So it does you can hear it does sound very clean. And it's funny to me because the system has a lot of similarities with how the sound is created on the Virtual Boy. Yeah, and if you remember earlier in the episode, we mentioned that the same creator of the Virtual Boy did the Wonder Swan. So you can see a lot of people in the progression of their career, you know, they may have learned a few tricks. I mean, essentially, the Virtual Boy is kind of a handheld you wear on your face. It, yeah, yeah. So, um, it, you know, the, the Wonder Swan is much smaller, and I just it was really cool to see that this is his next, you know, his big next, project. His next baby. Yeah. yeah, and they do share some similarities in the audio department, right? Because, like I was saying, you know, it relies on the CPU for for audio playback. Mm -hmm. And the Virtual Boy is the exact same way. It has these tiny little wave samples that it, it plays back, tiny little PCM samples that it plays. But um, I really want to go back to Channel 2 real quick mm -hmm. and talk about the, the PCM voice samples. Because... Like I said, this is mostly used for sound effects on Buffer's Evolution. Mm -hmm. So I have a few little samples I took out here. You want to you listen to those? Oh, quick? yeah, totally. All right. I'll give you an idea. So this is on channel two only. Mm -hmm. So it kind of gives you an idea. So here's the first voice. Da, da, da. It's not, <laughs> not that awesome, I know. I don't even know what she <laughs> said there. British. British. No, <laughs> that was Finnish. You know when you get to the end of the level, <laughs> yeah, it's Finnish. Yeah. yeah, so um, listen. British. Finnish. But that that is that 8-bit PCM yeah. voice data that you can hear, and that's on channel 2. Mm -hmm. So composers could decide to use that or not in their in their songs or in their in their piece, but uh, you know, this song didn't really have any need to do that. Mm -hmm. It was mostly used for the sound effects. Yeah, I mean, for the whole audio in general, you have to kind of, it can't just be music and sound effects separately. You have to find a, a nice creative a way balance. to mix them. Yeah, a nice good balance. And I did notice that when you're playing certain levels, there are some voice samples, which I thought was really cool for a uh, early handheld like this. Yeah. Let's get into some more music. We have a few tracks, um, but let's start with uh, stage B1 and we'll be right back. Thank <laughs> you. 
You just heard BGM 11 or Stage B1, composed by Sasaki Junana, Hira, and Neon for Buffer's Evolution on the Wonder Swan. This is a really frantic. Very, very frantic. Yeah, very frantic track. Um, I do like, uh, you know, it's mostly in the high end, but I do mm-hmm. like how the bass kind of sneaks in there. Yeah, uh, I thought the times. bass was very much like a supportive role in this track. Yeah, it kind of debuts like maybe 30 seconds in and mm-hmm. then it sticks with it for a little bit. But this is this is a cool track. I mean, it's really fast moving, makes you want to really race to the finish line. Oh, yeah. I think it's uh, pretty awesome. To me, I got this feeling of, you know, like when you beat a level, there's always like that really kind of quick jingle in most games. Mm-hmm. And this felt like... An a extended two minute you know, <laughs> version of that very quick jingle like like That's oh cool. you did it and it's like but i'm doing the level still <laughs> still working on it yeah anyways when you get into our next track oh yeah i'm ready for the next one what do we got we have bgm 13 or stage a2 slash d2 was the second stage a2 but also plays during d2 composed by sasaki junana hira and neon for buffers evolution on the wonder swan very cool track it was less very much less chaotic than the last one we listened to i love this one yeah and it's a lot lower like i feel like there's a lot more bass in this track than i mean that high range really is kind of like the star it really draws your attention to it totally but i thought that it was really nice to see a lot more going on kind of evens it out Mm -hmm. keeps it I guess a little bit more grounded. Yeah, I really like the uh, the swelling harmonics again. I think mm-hmm. that that's just it's so cool. And then they kind of play this like it's almost uh, like a like a trumpet line, just like and then he goes and like mm-hmm. up at the top there. Sorry, that sounded probably pretty <laughs> ridiculous, but I, I like that. I thought that was like yeah. so cool. I was like, oh man, that's awesome. No, it's definitely a great running theme throughout this whole entire soundtrack, which once again makes me feel a little sad not knowing where these composers backgrounds lie right right but i I think in this track that one thing that was really cool was i mean like i said there was that high range that was kind of like the star of this one but i felt like in the lower range there was a lot of really cool detail and a lot of really subtle deep notes that were going on is there there something you want to listen to yeah i wanted to see if you would break out a few of these channels um some of like the lower range stuff okay so uh like channel two or something i think channel two mostly does the bass here so Um, Let's listen to it real quick. Yeah, you can see like there's like some echoing going on and stuff like that, which I thought was really cool. Adds a lot of filler to this track. Yeah. I think what they're doing is they're they're uh, 
creating the volume and then they're quickly dropping the volume to make mm -hmm. it sound like an echo even though it's on the same channel yeah. they're not doing any different channel effects there that's yeah. really cool so it gives that feeling of like the echo or the trailing but it's not quite right it's, it's simple yeah. but it does add a lot to the track yeah Yeah, what a what an awesome track, mm -hmm. there, right? Great, great God. track. All right, let's get into our next track. This is uh, BGM twelve, and it plays during stage B three. You just heard BGM 12 or Stage B3, composed by Sasaki, Junana, Hira, and Neon for Buffer's Evolution on the Wonder Swan. Oh, man. I think that it, track just, oh, that that does it. Yeah. That hits my, my VGM G spot, I think. <laughs> well, and I think, actually, the, the group of these three tracks together was just a, a really great combination because the first one was super chaotic. The second yeah. one was much less chaotic and very more melodic and very deep. And this one was a very good blend of the of two. Of both. It, yeah. it, it bounces between simple melodies, simple, you know, uh, bass line. Mm -hmm. Even the bass is kind of like da-da, 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 da-da. Yeah, and, yeah. and then it jumps right back in to this very chaotic, um, sporadic sound. And mm -hmm. I think that's so awesome. And these sudden stops, like yeah. da 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 and da 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 da, -da you know, Like, yeah. that is so cool to me. That's... It's so well composed. This is brilliant. I yeah. Think. No, I mean, it. the The first track that we had played was very chaotic and was missing a lot of bass. And then right. the next track was very bass heavy. And this one, I think that bass really is what kind of grounded it. Like you were saying, it had a very simple beat to it. It let that high range kind of go off and really kind of, you know, tickle your ears and stuff like yeah. that. But all together, this track was really great. And I remember I looked up at you and you were, you were taking a drink while we were listening <laughs> and you were just like, oh, man, what? <laughs> what's going on? And at the same time, I was thinking the same thing. Like this note or this this track really exploded at a certain part and got really chaotic, but then brought itself back to being very grounded and uh, very easy to listen to. Right. And I thought it was fun and heroic and urgent, all wrapped into one track. Yeah, let's be honest. This soundtrack is way too good for this game. Uh, well, the game is fun. <laughs> no, don't the lie, The game dude. is fun, but yeah, lie. the soundtrack is oh, it's just so incredibly good that, I mean, I feel like we really did come across a, a VGM gem right here. Yeah, if you guys listening are, you know, you're into video game music, you're listening to this show, 
If you don't like this, just quit listening. <laughs> just quit listening now. No, I'm sure that everybody out there is like, oh man, dude, that was jammed. That's yeah, so good. It's just crazy nuts. I, this weird this, gem. I mean, it, just it was something as simple as saying, we haven't done a Wonder Swan episode. Let's do one. Something that's a game that didn't come on any other systems. Something that maybe no one's ever heard of. Right. And we found several games, and this one just really stood out. This was completely by accident, and such an amazing accident. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we've been talking about the music. We played three tracks back to back. Let's talk about the gameplay a little bit more. Let's get into the game, because I think that there's a a few things that we can explain uh, to kind of give you a better picture of of how the game looks and let's start with the um the stage so Mm -hmm. right when you start the game out you get to uh select the level you want to play it's a very interesting game the way everything Mm -hmm. is set up you get the title screen there's three different options there's enduro ss and results or is it rankings records records yeah 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 yeah. and so uh let's say you pick enduro Mm -hmm. you're immediately brought to uh the stage select screen or is it character select i I believe you select your character first right and so you have like i said the bird the lion and the rhino Rhino, yeah which we found don't really play any different from each other doesn't seem yeah and they share all the same power-ups so like when i was playing i got the unicycle power-up with the rhino, but when I went back and played as the lion and the bird, they also had that same feature. Right. And so after you decide on your character, you pick a, a level. And mm-hmm. these are kind of, you can start wherever you want, I think. Right. It's like, it starts with um, A, B, and C, and each of the letters has a, a you know, like a stage assigned yeah, to it. Yeah, like so one, a. two, and three. Yeah, so when we're saying these track names, you know, stage B1 or something, mm-hmm. that's the... I guess the fifth level in, or the fourth level in because it's like A one two three B one mm-hmm. and and you can kind of pick and play as you want. Yeah, it's, I mean it's like a lot of games that we've seen where you can play in any order you want. You could do A three and then C two and then go to B one and they don't really have any correlation to each other right. other than like A one two and three have a similar style and a similar look to them. I think it's kind of like more of like a factory type feel. Right. And there's like levels that have water and, and different types of environments but they kind of grow in a group and you can play them in any order which is really cool yeah the courses like you were saying they're they're kind of i guess unique they have a little bit of a theme to each one so there's some that are like jungle type areas right uh deserts industrial stages and then like these mechanical junkyards mm-hmm. and um i thought it was really fun because it gives you a little bit of diversity when you're playing you get to right. kind of speed run through this this level and i i guarantee you know if you guys are are wanting to try this out you'll have a, a lot of fun playing it i think oh yeah you'll enjoy some of these some of these stages well i mean i had so much fun just with the the very first level a1 that i i did all three characters we played it like 20 times yeah so. and then i did all three characters again <laughs> and i kept trying to beat my own right. score and i mean the first time i went through i was like not knowing what was going on and i took like five minutes and 40 seconds or something like that and then i started going a little faster and a little faster and i knew where some of the different power-ups are or the different uh mechanical pieces that you find and i was able to get down to like two minutes flat and it was right. just really exciting just even to battle yourself right when you select the course you get this really awesome kind of it's almost like a metroid map kind yeah. of diagram of of how it looks and it's, it starts kind of horizontal and then it moves vertical and yeah it's it's really well, cool it's it, almost like ghosts and goblins and it's kind of like two maps at once because there's like the flat like like just the side scrolling what the map looks like like how, how you can actually move yeah yeah and then there's a th- almost like a 3d isometric view of the the same exact map so you're looking at it kind of both ways which is really cool yeah i think that koto knew they knew what they were doing with the hardware yeah i was really surprised by i mean you can see like the flat map would be pretty easy to make but then that 2d or that 3d isometric view i was like wow that actually (laughs) took some thought into figuring out how that would work and may actually be even played into how the level was designed to make it look good in that 3d view which is really cool exactly so yeah so back to what you were saying like that it took you like two minutes to beat the first level it took Mm -hmm. nearly three Mm -hmm. and i thought i was cruising through at a pretty good speed i mean these levels are quite lengthy Mm -hmm. and it gives you a lot of exploration you know they're not just a single tier there's all these different kind of platforming elements and right well yeah and there's like multiple different paths you can take which they all lead to the same ending but you can you're like oh i got really good at the slide so i'm going to take this slide path instead of going up and over yeah it's really cool now the, the funny thing to me is that there's kind of like this electric beam or electric like uh i guess guard on mm-hmm. the top of the level that you can't jump out of no that was that was exactly a a design choice 
and that was the exact reason was that these these courses were created by the crime syndicate and they created these out of bounds areas that they did not want the players to go through. It's very and, horrible. Yeah. And there's like a, this electric <laughs> area that kind of zaps you. All right. So let's get into uh, some more music. I think that kind of explains the game pretty well. I mean, yeah. there's not, not a lot to go off of. You really have to play it yourself. Um, we're trying to explain it here, but this, it's yeah. kind of one of those things. You know? Well, and I mean, this game seems like you can spend plenty of hours playing it and having fun. Uh, we got, you know a couple power-ups but it seemed like there were plenty of spots to have a lot of different power-ups and Mm -hmm. i mean just getting that one unicycle feature really sped up a lot of the the map but it could also create a lot of problems with some of the the more precise platforming areas so seeing the the replayability of some of these levels with getting later enhancements and stuff like that was really kind of exciting for me yeah like i really want to pick up this this game, this game now. <laughs> for the actual physical copy. Yeah, so uh, anyways, let's get into some more music. We have uh, two tracks. Let's play uh, BGM 8 and BGM 2, and I'm not exactly sure where these play, but they're pretty awesome to listen to. You just heard BGM 8 and BGM 2, composed by Sasaki Junana, Hira, and Neon for Buffer's Evolution on the Wonder Swamp. Take your pick. Yeah. <laughs> Not sure who composed that, but uh, yeah, for all me, of the above. Yeah, for me, it had that uh, jam session feel that we talked about on previous tracks. It's so, very jazzy. Yeah, so maybe it was a specific person that you know did the previous tracks, mm-hmm. and we don't know, but um, I thought it was really cool. It had a lot of those starts and stops that you had mentioned earlier yeah. that were really, really noticeable in this track. Yeah, both tracks are really jazzy, like yeah. really, really jazzy, almost like a sped up like a sped up jazz bar like mm-hmm. a jazz bar on double time yeah um, very cool you know we wanted to clump these together because they do have kind of that that groove to them mm-hmm. you know it's 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 really nice I mean it's you know if if you slow this down if you slow it down to like um, I don't know let's slow it down real quick Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, so if you slow down like a little bit, it kind of still it has the the pop to it, but it's mm-hmm. a little bit more mellow. So yeah, I mean, but the idea of the track is to still. I mean. I would assume that this plays during a level that I haven't got to, or maybe you haven't got to, mm-hmm. or um, a, a different menu that we, we haven't we haven't really tried. So right, uh, but yeah, it is really fun. Well, and and I was actually thinking that maybe that kind of jazz kind of feel to it kind of plays to the whole crime syndicate feel mm-hmm. of of the whole idea behind the game. That kind maybe, of like an underground Yeah, kind of like thing. these guys are sitting in a club coming up with this idea and maybe sitting there watching. Like you, In some of the levels, you can actually see like a crowd kind of in the background. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But like maybe this is like something where it gives you more of a feeling of the crime syndicate actually watching in a, you know, a smoky club, you know, yeah. placing bets and collecting money and stuff like that, which yeah. I thought was pretty cool. The, both the tracks definitely went really, really well together. I think that they had a very similar feel that with, with that jazzy kind of feel to it, but... You know, they both kind of harken back to that stage select music too. Mm-hmm. It's kind of the same kind of jazzy club ambiance, I guess. Yeah. Anyways, um, so we've been talking about the game. The graphics are beautiful. Yeah. Um, do you want to get into the 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 graphics a little bit? There's no color. It's monochrome. Yeah, yeah. So. We mentioned it, the game's monochrome. Uh, we mentioned it has a really good resolution on the screen that has a lot of really good detail. You can see a lot of really cool things. We mentioned the map which has the, both different views of the same exact stage, mm-hmm. which was a really cool feature. And I think that the the artwork alone, the graphics alone, can trump anything on the Game Boy. I mean, oh, yeah. You know, it, it's a little bit simple to today's standards. So if you're going back and if you're a hardcore retro gamer like we are, you're going to appreciate it. But uh, it does significantly look better than a lot of the earlier handhelds. Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely. I mean, this this seemed like something other than the fact that it was black and white could compete against some early consoles, which I thought was really cool. A lot of detail, really mm-hmm. great animations, a lot of variety in the the type of attacks or motions that you could do, like the sliding, the jumping, switching right. into different modes. Um, and despite the the CPU limitation on mm-hmm. you know on the the clock speed, it actually plays pretty well. There's not mm-hmm. a lot of slowdowns. You know? Yeah, I think one of the reasons that that works really well is that there's not really a lot of moving enemies in the the it, levels that it, we played. There mm-hmm. was a lot of they're kind of static. They're kind of in your way, and you have to switch into that buffer to make sure you're not taking damage. But mm-hmm. a lot of really cool details. The enemies were were great. I, like you said, no slowdowns that we really noticed in the levels that we played. And all in all, this was a really well put together game. Yeah. So we we talked about the enduro mode, which is basically the main game. Yeah. Um, also on the title screen, you can select S S, mm-hmm. and we never could figure out what that actually meant. Yeah. But to explain what it does is S S. So you select S S. You've completed a level. Let's say you completed uh, stage one A or A one. Mm-hmm. And um, you've you've beat it in the main game. You go to SS in the menu, and you can replay the level. But it's not the same level. It's completely yeah, changed. Not at all. It's a completely different style to it. Which yeah, which exactly. took us a second. We thought, okay, maybe this is gonna be like a different type of mode, or maybe they've added more men- enemies and stuff like that. But it's a completely different layout. And the whole goal of it is you have to com- you have to beat. All the enemies that are in the level. It'll say it'll say like enemies four. And yeah. Each one you kill counts down, right? Right. Yeah. And then you have to find the kind of like exit to the level. Mm-hmm. And if you get to that exit and you haven't beaten all the enemies, nothing happens. But if you have, then there's like a finish or there's some type of audio cue that that you're done. Well, let me let me play that finish. Yeah. British. <laughs> British. <laughs> British. Uh, yeah. So you do have to to kill all the enemies first. Mm-hmm. But uh, it still does track your time. Yeah. So and it is still a time limit. Yeah. And it's pretty difficult because they have these destructible blocks. And there are definitely areas where you can fall into that you can't get back out of. So you have to kind of just restart the level and try it again. Which, for me, there was a few of them where I just kept getting bounced into these areas where I couldn't get back out of. Yeah, and, and I was like, oh, James, just restart. Dude. Yeah. Just restart. You're not going to get out of there. Just restart. So it created a whole different type <laughs> of speedrunning challenge. Uh, instead of getting to this end of this very long level, you had to attack enemies and right. then get to this goal as fast as possible. Well, we have some more music to play. You want to get into it? Oh, yeah. What do we got? You have the list in front of you. Yeah, we have BGM 10 or stage C3.
All right, that was from Stage C3, composed by Sasaki Junana, Hira, and Neon for Buffer's Evolution. What a awesome track, right? Yeah. That was cool. Feels a little different. To me, it felt almost like a boss battle type track. Yeah. Compared to some of the previous tracks we played. It was a little slower, a little bit darker feeling. Um, right. I thought it was really cool. To me, it almost had a western cowboy feel to some yeah, yeah I, I was thought, thinking like, that too thought like oh maybe this could have been like for fit into like a, a handheld sunset riders or something yeah i think what does that is the the sweeps they're very mm-hmm. prevalent in this in this oh, track yeah. and i think that kind of gives that uh, almost like um that kind of whistling kind of sound mm-hmm. right uh but i i just i thought this was a a wonderful fun VGM track to listen yeah. to. I mean, like, I, I don't know how to explain it. It's yeah. just really cool. It's whimsical and uh, kind of adventurous, and it kind of has a little nasty side to it. And yeah, yeah it's cool. I, I, and it, it, I thought it was really cool when it dives into that really deep part right before the loop. I thought it yeah. was really cool. Like, it, it, it slowed down and kind of took away all those high like cowboy chimey type sounds and i thought wow that's a really neat way to go into the next loop yeah so we do have another track to play this Mm -hmm. is bgm 16 i'm not sure where it plays you look to Mm can find it uh bgm 16 and we'll be right back You just heard BGM 16 from Buffer's Evolution on Wonder Swan. I wish I knew where this track plays. This is masterful. Yeah, very, very Holy cool track. Holy crap. What an action oriented, mm-hmm. you know, uh, in your face, just a mile a minute, you know, track. I just, I abs- this is why I listen to VGM, I yeah. think. You know, this is a very, this is the essence of what I like. Yeah, I mean, it, a lot of these tracks don't have very long sections before they start looping, but mm-hmm. they cram a lot of really good stuff into it. Like, this track is a very good example of it where there's this really cool, like, two or three second start to the song, which mm-hmm. is very kind of fun, and then it gets kind of this dangerous feel, and then it kind of transitions into this more, a little bit lighter hearted, more fun track, and I was like, wow, there's a lot of transitions, and then it just loops loops again yeah and each time i've noticed in all these tracks where when you're playing the game you you can kind of notice it's looping while you're playing it's, right they're very in your face kind of tracks 
but you're really excited to hear that next loop again, even though you know it's going to be the same thing. Everything goes together in a big track. Which is kind of funny because the whole point of the game right. is to not hear those loops. Yeah, as few loops as possible. Get right. through levels as fast as you can. But, yeah. Um, I mean, this is just a very, very well-written soundtrack as a whole and right. as individual tracks by themselves. I'm, I'm really thinking, man, like this has got to be... This has got to be somebody else. <laughs> you know, maybe Music Fox uh, from BGM Rips would, uh, you know, be able to provide some info or some of the other guys there. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you guys know, man, like, or if you guys have some hints, like, maybe we can follow a trail somewhere. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, maybe uh, Pixel Tunes, maybe Ed, Mike, you have yeah. some ideas. Like, let's let's track this down. These guys yeah. are awesome. We might have to look into some more Coda Laboratory, Wonder Swan games, see if there's any type of trends or themes and right. maybe different pen names that are used we can kind of start grouping together and start figuring this out because i mean all three of these guys are or or ladies are really well designed tracks and just really good at what they do yeah no i mean even in this track you hear the little like like phaser kind of like pew, yeah like the sweeps are very prevalent uh the percussion line the white noise is just oh it's all, all over the place mm-hmm. the the bass again is doing its own thing and then you got those really just graceful harmonizing leads that make the soundtrack i think just it's pronounced outside yeah. of a, a lot of other wonder swan titles well it just feels like these composers any any limitations you put on them don't feel like limitations at all yeah i i mean we've been talking about the music we've been talking about the different aspects of the game mm-hmm. i mean i i thought the game was pretty cool yeah I really did. I, no, I, I truly think this game is worthwhile, worth playing, yeah. and worth going through. If you're into, uh, if you're not into retro games and you, you go back, you might not enjoy it. But if you really appreciate the kind of hardships of these these early systems mm-hmm. or these you know earlier systems, I think you'll really appreciate it and you'll have a lot of fun playing. Oh yeah, I mean, in this game to me was when I first started seeing it, I was like, oh yeah, I could totally see a little bit of the Sonic feel to it. Uh, even kind of had like a Mega Man with like a sliding and the the, the very geometric level design and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And I was like, wow, if, if you took a game like that and the whole goal was to get through the level as fast as possible, that's kind of what you would get. Um, great graphics, excellent sound. Uh, to me, was just this was something that if you have the ability to play through emulation, definitely do it. Definitely and do it. Yeah. I, we haven't looked up how much the cartridges and stuff cost for this game. I'm curious. Yeah, I'm curious too. But this definitely feels like a game that you're going to spend a lot of time with and have a lot of fun with. No matter how many times you've gone through the same level, you get more upgrades, and it just feels like a whole new game. So to me, I was I wasn't really that surprised to see this got decent reviews. One of the things I saw was in 2004, Planet Wonder Swan gave it a seven out of ten. And Pocket Magazine gave it four out of five stars, which is not bad. Not not bad at all. Especially for how we said, you know, some Wonder Swan games are a little hit or miss where they have really bad sound or terrible gameplay, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And they weren't really designed for a world market. So Right. Well, hey, I just looked it up. You know mm-hmm. how much it goes for? Give me, give me a ballpark figure. Uh, well, I'm hoping it's like under twenty <laughs> because I want it. But. All right. So what if I told you it was nineteen dollars and fifty cents? That's free I've, shipping. I feel like that would probably be worth it for the amount of time that Just I would want to spend. Wait until I go back to Japan. I might be able to find it for like a buck. Yeah. <laughs> it's that's that's pretty tempting though. Yeah, but I mean, the, considering the price the game probably was when it came out, and the replay value, and the music, and you know everything in in combination, it's, it's a, really cool. It seems like a really fun game, mm-hmm. uh, something that people may never have heard of, and that it's something you can have in your collection and say like this is something that's actually really good. Now I do want to mention there is a tiny speedrun community kind of wrapped around this game. Mm-hmm. I <laughs> I was surprised mm-hmm. actually. I was I was shocked. To be honest, oh, I, I saw. I was like, "Oh my god!" Like, I know there's speed runs for everything, but like, this is. I, yeah. I think this is pretty out there. Yeah, as far as obscurity well, for level. a handheld system that didn't come here. But I mean, I, we love you and I love watching. You know, SGDQ and AGDQ. Oh yeah, we like don't really get any we're work gonna, done gonna... during that time period. <laughs> but I was always surprised by some of the games that I've seen. But I don't think I've seen any Warner Swan stuff like that. So it's kind of definitely like outside of the main speedrunning right. community which is a very broad spectrum yeah there is, so there is a, a, a little group of people i don't know how recent some of the uh you know uh speed runs are but if you go into youtube there's a speed run and i think right now the world record 
or the you know recorded world record is uh, 40 minutes and five seconds for the entire game for the entire game so i mean you know it's not that it's a a long game but these are like race levels and there's a lot of them so that's why it kind of takes its time i think to get through oh yeah and i could see this definitely being a very precise with a kind of pinball feature when you Mm -hmm. hit the enemies they bounce around if you know they could bounce you backwards and and, or down when you want to go up and that could really ruin a speed run so 40 minutes at someone's speed running and we've seen games that have taken you know maybe an hour or two to beat normally beat in like 10 minutes yeah. in speed run so 40 minutes is pretty big yeah and there's no like glitches found or weird hacks or anything mm-hmm. like that and I'm, granted most of these are through emulation but still i mean there's somebody going through the game in 40 minutes so that's pretty yeah. impressive you know i i would love to see this at sgdq oh yeah totally that's, that's our jam dude every yeah. year we watch it man no and we definitely we always donate and we're always like super pumped to hopefully hear like yeah. our donation read but i mean it's just a great community doing things for a great cause to see all these people put on this time and effort into these games that some people have written off for you know ps3 ps4 xbox Mm -hmm. all stuff like that and there's so many games that people have never heard of that just deserve so much more attention yeah so we do have another track to play this is bgm 15 and we will be right back heard bgm 15 from buffers evolution on the wonder swan good god i didn't think the soundtrack could one up itself anymore <laughs> and we got this track and it's just so good yeah it's oh a really good track to me it feels like uh, it could be possibly like a credits tri- type track yeah it's very uh, heroic and melodic and i mean there's like pitch bends and slides and uh, sweeps I mean just all over the place and then those like quivering notes like if I could <laughs> if I could be a note that's the type of note I would want to be <laughs> <laughs> quivering and shivering in the yeah, corner yeah it just it just adds so much dynamic emotion and this like feeling to the track just by making the note kind of flutter like that yeah I don't know for me it has this very Mega Man vibe in the beginning and mm-hmm. then it drops and then when it drops it kind of goes into this more soaring kind of guitar solo but with like another you know guy being the backup guitarist doing Mm -hmm. his you know kind of harmonization with it again we get these really awesome like sweeps again Mm -hmm. and if you guys didn't like it i don't know what to say (laughs) i don't know what to say this is is really good yeah i I think i I hope that like our email is gonna blow up with like i've never heard this game this music was cool i mean that's that's my hope but we get a lot of email but you know like just hoping you guys uh, have a, a little bit of a reaction to that. Yeah, I mean, in, in the Wonder Swan, like we talked about, it's not really a system that gets a lot of love. That was one of the reasons why we wanted to really poke right. around with Especially it. Especially in the VGM stratosphere. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the stuff that came to the U.S., there's so much good stuff that came here, but there's so much stuff on big systems that didn't come here. But this was just an entire small you know, blip in the video game world of a system that that didn't come here that had some really cool stuff. And this, yeah. this game... It's not like over the top exceptional in any way, but it does everything really well. Yeah, I think that the Wonder Swan in general, I I, I blame Bandai actually for the right. fact that it didn't come overseas, the fact that it didn't do overly well in Japan. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think a lot of that is their marketing and stuff like that. It could have been a very 
uh, successful system here. Maybe mm-hmm. even if it had launched maybe a few years earlier. I know, you know, timing is a big thing and stuff, but I think right. that this system could have done very well. Systems like the Neo Geo Pocket Color try to make a, you know, a, a US or North American debut. And it, right. it's not that it failed, it just... It didn't catch the. I didn't mean, catch everybody's eye. I mean, Nintendo at that time was a complete monster. I mean, anything that you threw at it. I mean, I am still so surprised that the Sega Genesis did as well as it did compared to the the Nintendo and the Super Nintendo. Right. And that it lasted as long as it did. Nintendo seems to eat everything up with the Game Boy, which is one of the biggest, most amazing handhelds ever. And this came out at the same time. The Neo Geo Pocket Color, like you mentioned, didn't really make a big debut here in the U.S. They're hard to find. Right. Didn't they're, make a big splash. Yeah. I mean, even in Japan, like they're still kind of hard to find. Some of them were expensive because of their rarity. Bandai did kind of take a little bit of a wishy-washy stance on trying to get this out in, right. you know, just in Japan. I think the Neo Geo Pocket Color not doing that great in the U.S. kind of kept it in Japan. But I mean, I read a lot of reviews where people that really spent a lot of time with the system said that there was no real flaws with the system other than the fact that it didn't have a headphone jack and that the the fact that it was horizontal and vertical was you know very unique yeah it the very system un- ran I mean, really well had a really good library of games you know and everything was backwards compatible which was really cool if you had a color version you could play every game right. it didn't matter which system you had yeah. you could do it all which is very nice and especially nowadays when you see like even like some different iterations, like the new 3DS won't play everything, and it's it's it, it's well, nice it, to see. It, no, the new 3DS will play everything, but the games it, there's certain ones that only play on it. Which, yeah, well, I think that's only Xenoblade. Well, there's a, there's a few. I think uh, uh, Binding of Isaac stuff like that. Okay, they're okay. all like ports, which yeah. is surprising. They yeah. released an entire system. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's for another episode. I yeah, guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, like I think too that the, the vertical aspect is is definitely. Would have been definitely a very awesome feature mm-hmm. to get in uh, Americans or Europeans' hands. Um, it's not that it wasn't done before. It's not that it's completely unique to the Wonder Swan because the Atari Lynx actually had the same right. function, but the Atari Lynx was marketed pretty poorly as well, mm-hmm. and it didn't have strong um, third party, you know, right. behind it or third parties behind it that uh, that um, Nintendo had. So. It, yeah. fell short there i mean square enix taito i mean those are some huge companies that put some time and effort into mm-hmm. this handheld so i mean those are companies that made huge worldwide presence yeah. too so i it mean it's really kind of surprising to see it didn't come here even the licenses though like i i think that you know getting one piece and stuff in japan that one piece was hot at the oh, time yeah. and getting those those licenses specifically for you know, under Bandai's console was that was a big thing. That was mm-hmm. a big deal. Anyways, I think we uh, we're about done with the show. Yeah. I hope you guys liked it. I had a lot of fun, man. Like this oh, was, yeah. you know, it's hard to it's hard to compare with our last episode because you know that was kind of a big one. But uh, oh yeah, two year anniversary is definitely always going to be hard to to follow up. But I think we picked a game. <laughs> I, to me, I'm really excited to. Looking into some more Wonder Swan to not really keep it off to the side. Like maybe it, there's some more really good gems to, to pick out. Well, there are because we had some uh, some runners up for, mm-hmm. for doing this the show, and we'll get to them eventually. Anyway, so today we covered Buffer's Evolution. Weird, horrible name actually. <laughs> yeah. uh, Buffer's Evolution on the Wonder Swan, composed by Sasaki Junana, Hira, and Neon, and uh, had a lot of fun listening to the soundtrack. I'm sold. Like, I want yeah. this game now in my arsenal. Mm-hmm. And if you want to know more about the show, you can check us out online at pixelatedaudio.com for show notes and track lists. We can also be found on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Pixelated Audio. Yeah, send us a, a comment if you guys want to, you know, hook up and tell us a few things, what you thought about some of the, the music. Please, you know, on the website, it's a great way mm-hmm. to do it. Twitter's awesome, you know, Facebook, however you want yeah. to let us know what you think about some of this music is cool. Yeah, we personally read everything. And if one of us finds something before the other one, we definitely send each other messages saying, oh, did you see this one? No, Check I saw that out. one. Did yeah. you see this one? And it it's just always brightens up our day. Yeah. And one of the best ways you guys can give us some feedback is leaving us a review on iTunes. Mm-hmm. We really appreciate it. You know, give us as many stars or as few stars as you feel necessary. But reading the the comments from you guys, hey, like I was totally jamming to this track. I really mm-hmm. like this. You know, I I hated this. You know, really appreciate it. We'll definitely uh, take all that those considerations to heart. Anything you guys want to send our way, we'd love hearing it. Yeah. So next week, 
We actually have a fun episode from a uh, request, mm-hmm. and um, this is gonna be fun. I'm, yeah. I'm really looking forward to it, man. It's, it's a it's a great soundtrack, and I think it's uh, it's gonna be fun to listen to and uh, talk about. Yeah, and and we'll have a guest, and they are very excited about that episode. So, <laughs> yeah, because it was their request. Yep. Anyways, the track taking us out. So uh, we've played a lot of music today. This is a really cool track. This is BGM twenty. I don't know where it plays. I don't think you knew where it played. No. Yeah. Anyways, uh, again, composed by Saki Junana, Hira, and Neon for Buffers Evolution on the Wonderswan. See you guys in a few weeks for the next episode.